I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. If you're a regular listener, you may have predicted this episode was coming, given my previous declarations of love for sweet peas. I'm speaking to Philip Johnson of Johnson's Sweet Peas. Philip grows and sells plants and seeds via his website, and he sells and exhibits his plants at shows across the country when they're on. He judges at major shows and has put in 25 years service as a sweet pea judge. He's a former chairman of the National Sweet Pea Society and is currently serving as a member of the RHS Herbaceous Committee. So what Philip doesn't know about sweet peas, you could write on the back of a stamp and still have room to lick it. I start by asking about seed sowing. When should we sow our sweet pea seeds? Should we do it now or in the spring? Okay. Um, well, even for me, the longer that you grow them, the more you discover about them. Uh, and normally I would have said, yep, October, that's the best time to sow them because you get uh, that much more root development over the winter and then you get bigger, stronger plants that are off to a good start in the spring. So it's still a good way to get those early blooms, but I found that you can actually sort of uh, successionally sow right the way through the winter, probably until about um, the end of April, and still get uh, quite a decent crop of blooms towards the end of the summer and into the autumn. So successional sowing seems to work really well. Ah, that's interesting because I have to admit I leave mine until much later on and therefore I have sweet peas quite late into the year um, because I find a problem with them basically getting a bit leggy and out of hand and then by the time I go you know by the time it's warm enough to plant them out um, I find that they have just gone completely out of control and got into a tangled mess really. Um, Are there any kind of hints and tips for that to avoid that? Yeah definitely so if you're sowing in the autumn and then you're keeping them uh, over the winter to plant out in the spring, then really you need to treat treat them mean. Keep them uh, somewhere um, qu- quite cold. So they want to be either in a cold greenhouse or ideally a cold frame if you can. And they'll even take uh, a touch of frost uh, as long as you've um, you know kept them hard to start with. Um, so that, that's really the technique. The, the worst thing you can do is keep them too warm or not give them enough light. And then they'll just uh, romp away, become spindly, become weak and uh, not a lot of good. So lots of light, and nice low temperatures. Yeah, I think that's probably my problem. I probably mollycoddle them and... It's it's light. easy to do. They're, you know, they're, they're classified as hardy annuals and uh, it's surprising how, how hardy they are. I mean, when I grow them as well, I think... Part of the problem is that I grow them early and then I don't have, like I said, it's difficult to hold them back until it's time to plant them out. Can you just talk about when we should be planting them out as well? Yeah, it's if you're sowing them in the autumn, then really, uh, certainly in the southern part of the country, you can plant them out in in early March as long as the ground isn't too too sticky. So if you've kept them really cold through the winter, they'll be sort of hardened off and ready to go at any stage. So as I say, in the southern part, if you can get on the ground, then anywhere from early March would work. If they're getting uh, too leggy, too long, then you can pinch them back uh, once or, or even twice. Okay. And when you put them out, if there should be frost after they've been planted out, will that be a problem? Well, it's you know, it, as I say, if you've if you've been brave uh, and treated them mean, then they should be okay. But if you're a bit worried about it, then just popping a bit of fleece around them, uh, that does the trick. Keeps that little bit of frost off, and they should be fine. And does it check them a lot if they do get a little bit of frost? Um, it'll knock them back just a touch, but uh, they, nine times out of ten, they'll send out uh, shoots again from the base, so you shouldn't lose them. All right. Because sometimes what happens with mine, if I get a bit keen, I'll plant them out and they go a bit yellow. Is that just the stress of getting cold? Yeah, it's probably probably the stress, probably that transition from being somewhere relatively warm to being cold outside. That's that's going to affect them. But it's, you know, it, it takes a bit of practice and a bit of bravery, as I said, to to keep them cold through the winter. And then they're, you know, they're hardened off and ready to go. 
Um, I suppose you could try sort of, you know, if you if you have kept them a bit warm, then no reason why you shouldn't sort of harden them off in the in the traditional way. Yeah. And what about germination temperatures for the seeds? Well, again, uh, going back to the autumn sowing thing, if you put them in in the next uh, month or so, uh, up to the end of October, then the temperatures should be warm enough to get them up in uh, sort of a week to two weeks' time. If we're in the winter, then, yes, they need a little bit of heat to get, just to get them started. If you're going to do that on a windowsill indoors, then literally as soon as they're through the surface, pop them out into that greenhouse cold frame or even somewhere sheltered up against the house. Because, as you know, if they're on that windowsill, they just stretch in, in no time at all. Yeah. So we're talking an unheated greenhouse, they're fine. In. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. And out of interest, can you grow them in a polytunnel throughout the year? Will they cope with that or do they not really like the sort of humidity and temperatures? They're usually okay. Um, we start um, planting out the polytunnels in the next uh, in the next month, and then they'll go through the winter to flower early next year. Um, but they don't like the really hot temperatures through the winter through the summer. And uh, you no, know, so far they've been okay in the polytunnels over the winter without any more heat. So it it should work. Mm-hmm. It should work, but uh, the really high temperatures that we had earlier this year, they really didn't like it. No, I don't suppose they did. No, nobody did. I don't think. I, um, I wasn't keen either, but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, thinking about seeds as well, uh, I have lots of uh, friendly little mice and things who like to eat them, and I'm always reading tips about soaking your seeds in paraffin no. and all the rest of it, or chili powder. Is there anything that works to keep mice and things off of your? <laughs> It's tricky because there's such, I don't know, devious, tricky little things to keep out. It's it's really tricky. I I find that the worst stage is just as they're germinating. I, I don't know whether the seed sort of releases some sort of sugary thing uh, that that seems to attract them or not, but that seems to be the worst worst time. Um, I'm afraid I have to put traps down. Um, I, I haven't found a more successful way of deterring them. No, they so, are toe rags. Um, they're not going to say that, but... No. Well, actually, I got round it this year um, by, well, a combination, I think, of outfoxing them so they didn't realise that they were there until it was too late. And also <laughs> I managed to um, cover the... I, I literally covered the pots and they couldn't get to them, uh, including okay. at the bottom and everything. Um, but it was faffy because I had to take the covers off in the day, put them back on at night. So yeah. because I'm doing it small yeah. scale, I can do it, but otherwise imagine it's hard um yeah okay so talking about pinching out plants and sort of you know keeping them you know short and bushy and all the rest of it mm. is is that you know a necessity or can we get away with not doing that um again you, you keep on learning so what i would normally have said is if you're sowing now leave them alone pinch them out at the end of january so leave them as long as that. Mm. Um, and that means that when you come to plant them in out in March, then you should have a nice bushy plant that you can still handle without the side shoots being too long. Yeah? Yeah. If you're sowing them, let's say, after Christmas, then once you've got two pairs of leaves on them, then nip the tip out at that point because you've got that much shorter growing season, so you need to get those side shoots going. Right. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> But I've actually found that through growing them in the polytunnels, that by sowing them now into into plugs and then transplanting them, we don't pinch them at all, and they make the most amazing bushy plants. So whether it's because if you, instead of encouraging the plant to grow up, I've seen a lot of people that put the seedlings straight onto canes. If you let that first bit of growth just flop on the on the ground on the top of the pot, by reducing that vigour that seems to encourage them to send out the side shoots. So does that make sense? Mm, yeah. So it's it's certainly been very noticeable this last year with us, and I'm going to try it again this year. But uh, that may be another way of looking at it. So don't be too keen to get that first shoot growing upright. Okay. Well, that's a really good tip. Um, and in terms of flowering, are there things that we need to do, you know, to, to ensure good blooms? Are there tr- tricks that we can do? For that well i suppose if it's sort of general growth um you know they're like a rich root run so they're always easier in the ground than in pots and if you can get some you know rotted organic matter into the ground or 
bag of multi-purpose compost, something that's going to hold some moisture, and then um, some sort of general fertiliser, fish blood and bone, grow more, something of that sort. Then that gets them off to a good start. So if you're keeping the plants healthy and vigorous, um, you know, you're going to get a, a, a lot of blooms um, as a result of that. And we don't need to remove flowers or anything like you might with a dahlia? I, I wouldn't worry too much. I tend to let them bloom as soon as they want to. You, you sometimes lose some of the early blooms through bud drop, but that's really sort of the plant settling and fluctuation in, in temperature and, and uh, in rainfall as well. Um, I wouldn't worry about the spudding thing. It, you know, if you let too many um, sort of go to seed, um, then that, that will slow the plant down, and they'll, you know, that, that'll uh, reduce the amount of flower you get. So, you know, so keep cutting them before they make the seed pods. Yes, we've all noticed that one rogue uh, seed pod at the bottom of our plants that we've forgotten to off. Yeah. Um, so is it the case that if we miss one seed pod and allow it to go to seed, then that would be pretty much curtains for that I, plant? I, I, I really don't think so. Mm. No, I really don't think so. Just as a general, you know, if you're getting you know, a dozen stems or something gone to seed, then, yeah, that will slow them up a bit. Right. Oh, okay. But the odd one, we all miss the odd one, so. Yeah. yeah. So so the deadheading is just that. It just keeps it in a state of. Yeah, That's it. Yeah, it keeps it going. Yeah. Yep. One of the things I notice a lot as well with mine is that as a, as the season goes on and I cut the flowers, the stems get shorter. Do you, why mm. is that? And is there anything we can do to avoid it? Yeah, a couple of things there. So the first one is that you tend to find that uh, the first blooms come before the weather warms up too much. And so the plant's got more time, as it were, to, to develop that long flowering stem and, and blooms. But as the temperature warms up, the plant wants to bloom more and more quickly. So it doesn't have time to develop that, that flower stem. And um, one thing you can sort of do to help to keep the stems longer is to give them plenty of water. So once they're into full flowering, full growth, then the last thing you should do is let them dry out. So a good soaking. It's still to be specific as to how often because, of course, the weather's uh, forever changing. But uh, don't let them dry out. But people do talk about growing them in pots. And if, if lots of people ask about that, but don't, don't grow the spencers because they're just too vigorous. If you can get a pot that's, um, I don't know, 45, 60 centimetres across and ideally a bit deeper, so a nice big pot, then you'll have some success with that. But uh, they're much easier in the ground as a rule of thumb. And are there any varieties that are prone to having shorter stems than others? <sighs> That's quite a question. Yeah. Um, the, the short answer is that there's lots of different types of sweet peas. So the, the ones that most people know are the, the spencers, and they tend to have the longer stems than the larger flowers. But then you have um, things like the, the old-fashioned types, the heirloom types, smaller blooms but lots and lots of them and shorter stems um, fantastic scent on them look really great in the garden lots of blooms on them that tend to have the shorter stems it's just a, a natural part of that um, you know that that group of plants and then there's there's other types as well that would tend to have slightly uh, shorter stems as, as part of their breeding right okay yep yep when we are training them up things do they have a preferred thing they like to cling to? Uh, I mean, I, I am just lazy and I grow mine up homemade wigwams out of canes, but I think probably they need a little bit more to, to get hold of. So what's your preferred method of support? It's, I suppose it's a bit different for me because I'm growing thousands of the things. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to use um, some netting, uh, some, either some galvanised or some plastic netting. And that's uh, that's quite easy for them to grip onto with those little tendrils that go all over everywhere. But I think there's something that looks nice in the garden. You, you see these sort of uh, hazel wigwams and the and the I've seen some um, uh, birch that's sort of um, plaited together to start with. I think that looks quite attractive. But um, I mean, that, as you probably noticed, they cling onto just about anything. So whatever whatever works for you, really. Yeah, and what I find is that I quite often underestimate the height they're going to reach. Is there a sort of average height, or does it depend on the variety? Yeah, it depends a bit on the variety, but certainly with the, the Spencer types, as I say, the larger things, they're probably going to make six to eight feet at the end of the season. So, 
whatever that is in, in metric, so two, two and a half metres. Um, the old fashioned thing is probably about, uh, about five feet up to sort of head height for most of us. Um, and then various types within that. So probably the most you're going to get is about six to eight feet. And the ones that we grow in this country are all hardy annuals, are they? They're not, there's no perennial ones. Uh, there are some perennial types. Um, there's Nathrus latifolius, which is that sort of shocking pink thing uh, that you see, comes up every year. I, I think it's a great plant, lots and lots of blooms, easy to grow, but no scent. So um, it's only really these annual sweet peas that we grow that have a, a decent amount of scent to them. So there are perennials, but no scent. No. And you can get that in white as well, I think. Yeah, there's uh, there's a, a deeper red strain coming right the way through to a sort of flushed pink and then and then white as well. Yeah. Do you have any good tips for conditioning them when you cut them as a, a to use as a cut flower? I can't really say that's my area of expertise, but uh, I'd certainly try to get them into some nice cold water as, as soon as you cut them right away, so don't leave them laying around. And once they sort of condition, then uh, the good old flower food um, seems to work wonders, keeps them going a bit longer. Yeah, I have to admit, I probably don't do any of the right things, but mine, they don't last long <laughs> in a vase, but... Yeah, well, you don't need them you know, so many. a lot of people say that, but you know, time you've had another two or three days, you've got more blooms on the plants, so exactly. it's uh, never ending. <laughs> um, and out of interest, should you uh, grow them in the same place year on year, or is it better to rotate them around? As with all things, really, it's better to rotate them around. Um, for me, I've had sort of up to about six or seven years on the same plot without any noticeable uh, deterioration but but after that yeah you start to see some problems so yeah. if you can move them around every couple of years then that's the best thing mm. and are they susceptible to any particular pests or diseases well last year was a bit of an aphid year for me and this year has been a bit of a mildew year um, and beyond that that tends to be as as much as you see with them so it tends to be aphids and, and powdery mildew that uh that is the, the problems yeah i think again the heat this year is i've definitely got powdery mildew on mine um mm. how do people avoid that well you can try by say keeping them moist at the roots so water the roots don't water the leaves it's that humid atmosphere that um, encourages the powdery mildew so keep them damp at the bottom put a mulch around of some sort of bark or compost or something like that to help with that but quite frankly, if, if you do start to get mildew and it does start to take hold, then I think you need to resort to a, a fungicide to uh, get uh, a grip on it. Yeah. I mean, this may be a daft question. Is there anything that they associate with particularly well uh, in terms of companion planting or, or neighbouring plants? Um, not that I've come across. That's not to say there isn't, but uh, it's not something that I've... <laughs> That I've heard of. No, it's pretty that. fair enough. So you mentioned scent, and obviously yeah. this is very subjective. But in your opinion, what are the best varieties for scent? <laughs> if I had a pound for every time I'd hear that <laughs> question, yeah, I bet. it's it's all in the nose of the beholder. To start with, um, and I think that um, certainly for some of us, uh, me included, that as we get older, the old nose doesn't work as effectively as it used to. Um, I also think that the scent's much stronger on a nice, bright, sunny day rather than on an overcast one. And I've noticed that when you walk into these flower marquees full of sweet peas, that for the first few minutes you can really smell the scent. But again, the nose becomes sort of acclimatised to it, so you don't notice it so much afterwards. Mm, so those, those are my sorts of provisos, if you like. After that, I would look at a group of... Um, sweet peas i'd either look at the old-fashioned and the heirlooms or there's another group called modern grandiflores with a mouthful um, and they tend to have the most highly scented as you know but sort of by by popularity if you like so you look at things like uh matacana that most people have looked at are, are aware of and uh, all but blue and high scent so those ones tend to, to come out tops in sort of scent tests, as it were. Um, so Spencer's do have a scent. 
for my nose, it's a little less complex, maybe a hint of citrus with it. The old fashioned ones and the modern granite floors tend to have a much more complex scent and a more spicy, more intense sort of scent. And that's that's just my view of it. So so different scents uh, for different things. Yeah. And why do some varieties kind of knock your socks off with scent? Is it down to just breeding? It, it could be. Uh, we, we haven't looked too far into the uh, into the whys and wherefores of it, but there's a, 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 a structure of the flower um, that shows itself in the old fashions and the modern ground floras that doesn't appear in the Spencers. So whether that clamped keel, as we call it, has a bearing on scent i'm i'm not sure but the two do seem to, to go together it's difficult to explain exactly what a clamped keel is without sort of showing you um, face to face but um to say heirlooms old-fashioned modern grandi flora will have the stronger scent yeah i saw a really interesting thing this year for the first time i had my sweet peas and then a bee came along and it pushed the flat the petals down with its legs and then it, mm. it kind of exposed the I don't know what it was it might be the anther I'm not very good with my uh, botanical yeah, yeah. terms and it just kind of rubbed itself all over the this <laughs> pollen covered tube okay. I've never seen it before so obviously there is something in it that, it that attracts wildlife even if it's only a particular species of bee I mean do you find that you're you, you're getting a lot of bees on the plot certainly seen more bees on them in the last few years to to previous times uh, and for me, they seem to sort of go in at the at the side of the bloom, if you like, at the back, um, avoiding all the pollen and, and just go for the for the nectar, uh, oh. I guess, in the back of it. Oh. But um, yeah, I certainly seem to see more bees on them. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's quite encouraging. Um, yes. Um, I wondered if there were any colours you don't see in sweet pea flowers. Well, the first one top of the list would be buttercup yellow. Um, there's a few sort of Fairly deep shades of cream now, um, but uh, I'd say that loosely buttercup yellow is, is the one. Um, uh, that, that's probably the, the, the main one that's, that's missing from the range. Most other colours are, are, are there mm. somewhere. And how I presume green wouldn't be? Well, green isn't. There's, there's, uh, there's a couple of them now that do show a bit of a green, sort of limey green tinge to them, but that seems to show itself more when they're grown under polythene or under glass. So there must be something in that cover that's uh, affecting the, the the colour of the blooms. So mm. one's for that. There's one called Limelight, which isn't so uh, available these days. And the other one, um, Cream Eggs. Yeah, oh, I like that one. Show that bit of uh, green. Mm. I um, bought some fantastic coral coloured ones from you this year and I didn't think I'd see that. That they they seem very unusual. I can't yep. remember the variety, yep. uh, but they are fantastic. They're still, still good. Blooming good right on. Now. Um, Glad they've been well. Well, yep. yes, they have, and I wondered because when I I actually did a flower arranging half a day recently, and um, they were talking about the flowers that we're going to see in Covent Garden Market next year, and it will be lots of apricots and oranges, and you know all things on that kind of. T- part of the scale color scale are you predicting yeah. any color trends for next year or have you seen anything in particular well certainly everybody seems to want these pale pastel as you say apricot peach uh shades and unfortunately for me they are the worst ones just for setting seed oh. um they're real pain for that so i, I think certainly for sweet peas uh, those sort of shades are going to sell out really fast mm. Okay, noted. I'm going to be on your website in a minute. <laughs> um, actually, well, that's a good point. When should we order? Um, well, I'm I'm still sort of cleaning the seeds from this year's harvest. Um, some people will have their, their sort of new ranges, new things available now. Uh, for me, it's probably going to be um, best part of another month before things get updated. Right. And can we, we can we pre-order or do do we just have to wait till it goes live? Um it's certainly with me, if if there's things that, that people don't see on the website that they're interested in, then by all means, drop me an email and uh, I'll see what I can dig out. Okay. Um, there's lots of other things that I've got that, that aren't featured on the website. Right. So apart from colour, are there any sort of other exciting developments on the horizon in sweet pea breeding? Well, lots of things. There's um, I've, you probably heard of a, a, a cross now between two different types of sweet pea 
family. So the sweet peas that we grow and, and know are called Lathyrus odoratus. Some 30 to 40 years ago now in Turkey, somebody found something called Lathyrus bellinensis, which is bright yellow and red in the same bloom. It's a sprawly looking thing, quite different. So several people have tried to cross the two together. And uh, the idea was to come up with one of these buttercup yellow uh, sweet peas. Hasn't happened yet, but it's thrown up a lot of varieties now that have a sort of iridescent blue in them, Ooh. which is is quite uh, quite unusual, quite striking. So you've got things like uh, Turquoise Lagoon and Blue Shift in particular. They're, they're showing these characteristics more than most. I'm doing a lot of breeding work myself using these things as, as parents, but they're a real pain to get fixed, you know, to get them to uh, to breed true each time. And I think it's because of all that, uh, what we call interspecific, um, you know, genetics going on there. It's still sort of all in the melting pot. So lots of things in the pipeline, but um, it, it takes longer than uh, than we'd hoped. Yeah, I mean, how long would it take you on average to to get one and make sure that it was breeding true? Yeah, if if I'm lucky, probably about three or four years, probably four years, I would I would say from the first uh, uh, crossing. Um, but but usually it's it's pushing out nearer to to ten years, I guess. Many thanks to Philip for sharing his experience and knowledge. Do go and check out the Johnson Sweet Peas website. If you struggle to get sweet peas going from seed, they also sell plants that are shipped out in March or April, which is brilliant if you don't have the space or time to grow from seed. Thanks to you for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a fluffy menace you may have been dealing with over the past few months. The woolly aphid is a common pest of apple trees, pyracantha and rock spray catoniaster. Where its colon is... Hidden under a canopy of thin wax strands are often mistaken for clumps of white mould along the trunk and branches. The aphids are actually dark brown in colour, but appear light grey and fluffy as they secrete the wax strands from pores on their bodies. En masse, the waxy strands create a defensive barrier for the colony, hiding it from predators and parasites as the aphids feed on the sap through the bark. During autumn, the adult woolly aphids start to die, whilst their nymphs leave the colony to overwinter within cracks and crevices in the bark, usually close to the site of the old colony. In spring, they become active and begin feeding and secreting wax again. They soon mature and start producing live young that rapidly begin forming the wax-covered colonies again. By midsummer, the colonies reach a peak and start dispersing to young shoots on the tree where new colonies are established. Once they feed on the new shoots, a chemical within their saliva causes lumpy deformities to grow. These growths provide areas of thin bark where the aphids can access the sap more easily, but they also swell and split, allowing canker disease to establish. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. 
or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.